How many of you are surprised that it's already the middle of July? Students, we got about a month till school starts, so uh, the countdown begins. Enjoy your last few weeks of the summer. How many of you are glad to be here this morning? It's good to see Bob and Karen, the Bosco Johns, all the way from Texas. Good to see you guys, and all the rest of you, too. I'm glad that you're uh, excited to be here this morning. I am. I'm glad to be able to bring a message to you this morning. And uh, I don't know how many of you have enjoyed the series that we're in, but I thoroughly have enjoyed this series, Who You Say I Am, as we're looking at uh, our identity in Christ. You see, we struggle to see ourselves for who God made us and and sees us and wants us to be. Uh, We've realized over these last few weeks that we're in a battle and we're fighting against an enemy who wants nothing more than to destroy us. And why we listen to him, I have no idea, but we do. And we continue to listen to his lies. But what we're trying to highlight in this series is the truth of who God says that we are. So you can go back and listen to any of the messages that we've had here. And there's been uh, just some tremendous communication from uh, all of our pastors in this series. And I know I've heard great feedback from that. Uh, as much as the good delivery, there's been some great content, and uh, I hope that you'll go back and just review and rehearse some of these even in months to come. This morning, as we continue the series, I want to talk about who God says that we are, and he says that we are overcomers. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loves us. John 16, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. How many of you found that there's trouble in the world? How many of you got trouble going on right now? Okay. It's, it's, it's there. Jesus said, don't be surprised by this. It's there, and it's going to happen. So uh, while he told us that uh, there is trouble, he preceded that by saying, I say these things that you might have peace. In this world, you'll have trouble. But the peace comes from the fact that he says, take heart, I've overcome the world. Philippians 4, 13, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. In Romans chapter 8, uh, he mentions that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves us. So this morning I want to start, uh, if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. The Apostle John wrote the uh, book of John, the uh, Gospel of John. He also wrote these three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, also the book of Revelation that we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at this morning as well. As we start at 1st John chapter 5, the first five verses kind of laying a foundation for where we're going this morning. I appreciate the song that we were singing, Hope Has a Name, and I just wrote down these lyrics because it fits so well with the message and what we're talking about this morning. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. He is our hope. My Savior's cross has set this sinner, he set me free through the cross of Christ. Hope has a name, his name is Jesus. Christ be praised, through him I have victory. Today as we talk about being a victor, being victorious, being an overcomer, uh, this is really just kind of points where we're going. First John chapter five, verse one, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. Verse 4, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So I want to just pull across the room today. How many overcomers do we have here? Okay. I'll ask the follow-up question. It's the same question. How many of you believe in Jesus Christ, that he's the son of God, he's the savior? All right. We're overcomers. We are overcomers. That's what he said. Who is it that overcomes the world? The one who believes that Jesus is the son of God. By virtue of that, we are overcomers. So John also wrote... um, to the, uh, wrote the book of Revelation, and in, the, in chapters two and three, he wrote several letters to several different churches, seven to be exact, 
And through the uh, uh, chapter two and three of Revelation, he writes these letters to various different churches. And toward the end of each of those letters, he makes a statement in every one of them, something similar, where he says something like this, to him who overcomes. So as we read in John, this letter in John, uh, 1 John chapter, uh, chapter uh, five that we read, he says, uh, if you believe in Christ, you have overcome. But then in these letters to the churches in, in, in Revelation, uh, he's, he says things like this, to him who overcomes, Revelation 2, 7, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. He who overcomes, to him who overcomes, uh, it may be another version that you, that you read, it's uh, to him who has victory. But the idea is, you, you kind of get this idea is that not everybody is overcoming. So in 1 John chapter 5, he says, we all who believe in Christ have overcome the world. But then in Revelation, he's, he's making uh, this statement that kind of leaves us to think that there are, there are those who are in the church who are not overcoming. So how do you square all of that and how do you reconcile the fact that he says, if you believe in Christ that he's the son of God, then you've overcome, you're an overcomer. But now he says, look, there's some that maybe aren't overcoming. Well, here's, here's, how, this, here's how this plays together. Um, it's possible for a person to be married, but not happy. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands here. But the reality is, whether you feel happy in your marriage or not, the position that you have is legally, you are married. Whether that's playing itself out like you think it should or it should be happening, it doesn't change the fact that you're still married, okay? There is a legal position, a legal definition of who we are as overcomers in Christ. Because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we have this position, we have this, this um, uh, place where we stand where we are overcomers. But the reality is, is we may not be living that out, okay? So I think about this, uh, imagine that it's raining, and it's not hard to imagine, we've had quite a bit of rain. Uh, we were on vacation for a couple of weeks and missed the deluge of rain that came two weeks ago. Um, and uh, I, I, I wanna say that I'm sad that I missed an event like that, but I'm not really sad. Uh, it, it's quite an event. So it's not hard for us to imagine rain like to the point where we might say it's raining cats and dogs. I understand it was literally almost raining cats and dogs. How many attest to that? I saw videos, I saw the effects of all that rain, but here's the deal, imagine that you're out in the rain and you have, uh, it's just coming down like crazy and you have an umbrella. Guess what that uh, umbrella represents? You're an overcomer. Because you pop that umbrella open and you can hold it out in the rain and while it's raining like crazy, you're dry. You're overcoming the rain. But, but, but say, for example, you've got that umbrella and you're using that umbrella as a, as a cane to walk with. It's pouring down rain and you've got your umbrella and you're using it as a walking stick. Overcomer or not? No. Still have the umbrella. You have the position of an overcomer. You've got the tool of an overcomer. You're just not overcoming. You're getting wet. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's possible that we are in this position for those who are in Christ to be overcomers, uh, but not be overcoming. So who does overcome and how? Turn to Revelation chapter 12. I'm gonna read a few verses here. Revelation chapter 12. On how to overcome. Revelation chapter 12, we're gonna start with verse seven. Then there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle, and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. And then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, it has come at last salvation and power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they have defeated him. Some of your versions said they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. It says that they overcame him by these three things. They overcame Satan, 
They overcame the accuser. He's a liar, he's a thief, he's a deceiver, he's an accuser. What other names can we add to him? Why we listen to this guy, I have no idea. But, we, but we're seeing here that we are victorious through Christ. He has no hold on us. But yet we're being overcome rather than being overcomers. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. So I want you to notice when we talk about they overcame by the blood of the lamb, it doesn't say that they overcame the enemy by prayer and fasting. It doesn't say that they overcame Satan through resisting and fighting. While there's something to say about spiritual warfare and aligning ourselves with God to do battle against our enemy, that's important and necessary. But Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? What is he saying in that statement? There is no one that can come against you if God is for you. If God is on your side, there's no one anywhere No thing anywhere, no entity anywhere that can come against you. God is our source. But the blood of the lamb, they overcame by the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb isn't something that you do. It's not something that you say. It is, and it is alone, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. His blood shed for you, for me, for all sin of all people of all time. They overcame by the blood of the lamb. It's the finished work of the cross. That, and that alone means, is the means of our cleansing, our forgiveness, our salvation. So you don't, you, you, you don't claim to be clean by your good works. We know that, right? It's by grace that we're saved, not of ourselves. It's not of works so that none of us can boast, okay? It's not our works uh, that make us good, or, or by claiming the blood of Jesus over, over various places or things. It's what Jesus has done for us on the cross. John said, chapter 1, John 1, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, and what did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He knew. 1 Peter 1, 18, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. It is the, they overcame by the blood of the lamb. Psalm chapter 51, David prays a prayer after he has committed adultery with Bathsheba and tried to cover up that adulterous affair by having her husband killed. Um, he's found out, and he comes to the Lord, and this is Psalm 51, we have his prayer, and this is, this is what David says. He says, have mercy on me, O God, because of, of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stains of my sin. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. David understood God's forgiving uh, ability to change us and make us something uh, that, that we're not. A father and his son were viewing a parade in London, England. And because of the chill and the wind, they stepped inside to a small store and watched the parade, the remainder of the parade, through a window. In the course of time, as the parade moved on, a regiment of British troops marched by, and the dad exclaimed, my, aren't those red coats just beautiful and awesome? And the little boy replied to him, Those aren't red, they're white. And the dad's looking like, okay, I don't don't get what my little boy is getting after. And he says, if you don't believe me, come look where where I'm looking for. So, So from where I'm looking from. So he kneels down where his son's at trying to explain to him, you know, I didn't know I have to explain what red is. But as he knelt down to look where his son was looking, uh, as he looked through the glass, uh, the, the red coats of the, of the British soldiers were actually, they looked white. And what, what was happening is there was a red band of glass around the window. 
And as you look through red glass at something red, it actually looks white. Now I did, I did some research because I, I read that and I thought, oh, that's cool, I've never heard that before. But there's no way I'm gonna say that without like proving it myself. So I went up in the attic and found a piece of red uh, cellophane and, um, and I looked at red things. In my office there is a, a, a white and red and black volleyball. And it's amazing when you look through, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You know the science of all this. I can't explain this. I read it, I just can't explain it back to you, but there's something scientific and physics with this that says if you look through red at something red, it takes all the, it's the way your eyes process thing, it actually looks white. So Mary Beth Helmick was sitting on the second row this morning in the early service with a red top on and a white sweater over it, and actually as I'm looking through this, looking at her, I, hey, looks pretty red in here. So the, the white sweater looked red and the red top looked white. I'm not making this up, it's real. So I think about this and I'm thinking, you know, scriptures like um, how, uh, script, it's, it's in Isaiah chapter one, no matter how deep the stain of your sins, God says, I can remove it. I can make you as clean as the freshly fallen snow. Even if you are stained as red as crimson, I can make you as white as wool. And so we think about this, the this, this sin, our stain of sin is often re- represented as red. The redness of sin, the crimson, stained like crimson. How many of you know it's hard to get stains out of things? Okay. Think of things like, you know, I'm not a, I'm, I don't do laundry. Actually, I was um, banned from doing laundry, laundry in my home a few years ago. Um, <laughs> My wife was working full time and I was off on Thursdays and we had kids still at home. So I was home all day and I thought, while I'm home, I'll just do laundry. And so I would do seven loads of laundry a day until a couple of times I um, actually washed uh, one of Jeannie's sweaters or two or maybe three (laughs) and uh, went through the dryer. And I I don't know what happens, but it looked like it was a baby sweater when it came out. (laughs) Who knew? but she polite, politely asked me not to touch the laundry again. <laughs> something, something like that. Um, but I know that it's t- difficult to get stains like um, grape juice or ink or blood. Those kind of things don't come out of clothes very good, right? The stain that's left there. But I think about the, the stains and the stain of sin uh, on our life that's red like crimson. And when we look at something like crimson stains and our sin, look through the blood of Jesus, guess what color it is? It's white. So he sees us, when he sees us through the blood of Jesus, what he sees is nothing but white. We are, we are forgiven, we are free, we are clean through the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus, it's the blood of the Lamb that make us overcomers. Doesn't mean we're perfect, it doesn't mean we're, we're sinless, it just means that we're forgiven. God can remove the stain of sin. If we're willing and just follow Christ, he's the one who can remove the worst sin from our life. Satan will come to us and and he's accuser and what he'll say is you're nothing but a sinner. How many of you heard a lie like that before? You've you've gone too far, you've failed again. God could never forgive you. Guess what, we know that's not true. Because of who we are, because of the blood of the Lamb. Even in, our, even in our strongest moment, our moment of victory, Satan will come to us and try to steal our joy. Uh, just like with Elijah. Elijah was on Mount Carmel going against the prophets of Baal. You remember this story? It's like 450 prophets of Baal against Elijah. And they were trying to see which God was going to answer and consume the sacrifice. And after the prophets of Baal, Baal for hours had, had chanted and and tore their clothes and cut themselves and screamed and yelled for hours and nothing happened. Elijah walks up and he knew. He had a faith to know that God was gonna come through. So much so that he had them dump buckets of water on the sacrifice, knowing that, okay, this, I'm gonna make this even more impossible. And, and through his prayer, God consumed that sacrifice and, and, and Elijah's God was the one who, was, who prevailed, the victor. In that moment, He saw an incredible victory where God came through, even through uh, all kinds of uh, things that came against, you know, with the water and all of that. God still came through. And yet, it's after that event where he runs from Queen Jezebel and finds himself hiding in a cave, wanting to die. 
How can we go from a place of victory to a place of running? You see, Satan comes to us when we're feeling discouraged and defeated too, trying to provoke us to give up. When at that moment, our only hope is to keep pressing on. It's these times when the enemy attacks us that we've got to inform, uh, we've got to inform our enemy and we've got to inform ourselves that our sin is covered by the blood of Jesus, that he is the one who washes our sin away. In his eyes, I'm clean. So when Satan comes to you giving you all these kind of lies saying you're nothing but a sinner, you've messed up too bad, there's no way God can forgive you, you know absolutely it's not true because through the blood of Jesus, we are white as snow. Amen? We're overcomers through the blood of the Lamb. Carmen, the great prophet of the 1980s, you remember him, singer, songwriter guy? This is what, this is what, how many know Carmen? Carmen? Okay, some of, you don't, some of you don't. Just go look him up on, on uh, Spotify. Some good stuff. But the song called Revival in the Land, I don't know if you remember that one, but this is a line that I took from that. He says, when Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. My past is taken care of. It's forgiven through the blood of Jesus. Your future, buddy, I'm sorry for you. Okay, who, who needs to be listening to who? Satan will try to attack us with fear and, and as if he has some kind of stronghold on our life. Pastor's talking this morning just in, in our prayer time about strongholds in our lives. But the victory in our lives has already went, been won by Jesus on the cross. He already won the victory. He has no hold on us and he knows this. He's such a liar, <laughs> such a deceiver that he comes and accuses us and he's the one who's in for, not us. Colossians chapter two, you go back and look this verse up if you got time. Colossians two, verse 13 to 15. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ and he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us. He canceled it all. And he took it, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. Listen to that. He disarmed them. And he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So through the cross, what he did was he disarmed them, those evil rulers, of any authority, of any power, and and, uh, shamed them in public through the cross. Imagine that someone pulls a gun on you. I don't know if you've ever had a gun pointed at you or pulled on you. I did it one time. I was selling books and Bibles door to door when I was in college. And I walked up to this house and knocked on the door. And you know, it was through a screen door. And it's kind of dusk. It was getting a little bit dark. And I probably shouldn't have been knocking on doors that late. But you know, time is money. And I'm out there anyway. So I'm knocking on this door. And I could kind of see faintly a, a, a figure through the screen window. And um, I heard somebody say, what do you want? It was actually a lady. That, that, that voice didn't quite match, but it was one of those, like, it was a strange kind of a voice. And, and I said, oh, and I gave my approach. You know, I'm just a college student out here talking. All these, and she interrupted me saying, um, you need to get out of here. You need to get away from here. And I could, tell, I could tell through the screen enough as she's walking toward me that there was a gun in her hand. You know what happens when a gun's pointed at you and you're told to leave? You leave, yeah. If someone had a gun pointed at you and they're telling you to do something, guess what? They got power over you because they got fire. And if you don't do what they say, you, I mean, it could, be, it could be fatal. It could be devastating. And so, um, so you're, there, you're at, their, at their mercy. You do whatever they tell you to do. But, but here's the thing. If you found out that there was no bullets in the gun, different story altogether. They can hold a gun at you and they can try to make you do all this stuff, but you find out there's no, no bullets in that gun. It's like, it's on. It's you and me, buddy. We're, I don't care if you're bigger than me. I can take you at least this way. I can't take that. But all of a sudden, they have no, no power. Their power, their authority over you is, is nothing. The reason that Satan can, can defeat us is that he deceives us into thinking that there's still bullets in the gun. But what Jesus did on the cross, he said, I disarmed them. And I shamed them publicly by what I did on the cross. Guess what? We're overcomers through the blood of the Lamb. 
His only hope is his efforts to, in his efforts to destroy us is for us to forget that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ, love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter eight, let me read what Paul says. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us? whom God has chosen for his own. No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and he's sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. This is our God. Can anything ever separate us from from Christ's love? Does not mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Does that mean God doesn't love us? What did Jesus tell us? First verse I said, John 16, 33, in this world, trouble. Doesn't mean that if we're in trouble and we've got all these things going on that he doesn't love us. That's what the enemy would like to say. God doesn't love you. He's not taking care of you. And how many of us have said, God, where are you and why, why are you doing this to me? Over and over the scripture tells us that all those things when, when we're facing difficulties and trials and things like that to count up your joy because it's working for our good if we'll just trust God through it all. He's, he's never left us and he's never stopped loving us. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. And I am convinced, Paul says, that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. That's what you need to hear today. Sin can't separate you from him. He's got an unloaded gun. It's made out of soap. (laughs) you hear what I'm saying it's a plastic little toy gun he can't do anything to you unless you let him he can wield that little thing he got out of a toy store out of the dollar store and wield it you say look and we're dancing doing his little dance and worried and fearful come on for real we overcome by the blood of the lamb No power in the sky or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that's revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains. It's the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. It's already defeated our enemy. The victory over Satan belongs to us because of Christ. On the cross, Jesus lifted the sins of the whole world for all people for all time. That's it. No matter how big your problem is, no matter how big your stuff is, you've got a Jesus who is big enough, who's strong enough, who is able enough. Revelation 12, 11 says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Just, that, that first part was a longer part. Uh, pay attention as we finish this up. First John 5, 9. Since we believe human testimony, surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God. And God has testified about his son. All who believe in the son of God know in their hearts that this testimony is true. Those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar because they don't believe what God has testified about his son. So when you believe in, the, believe in the enemy and not God, guess what we're calling God? A liar. Don't do that. Don't do that. And this is what God has testified, verse 11. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Here's the deal. 
They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. We're calling this word confession. You see, if God has saved you, if God has turned your life around, if he's given you new life, then the most natural thing that you would do is to tell people about it, right? How many of you have told people about your life in Christ, given testimony of what God has done for you? Just raise a hand if you've done that. How many have done that in the last, in the last month, in the last week? Why are we not talking about this? It's not just something to do when it's all new. Here's the deal. We were talking about getting stains out of clothes. If if, if you saw one of these infomercials and it said, you can get ink, you can get blood, you can get all these kind of things out of your clothes, and one of you decided to call and try this as seen on TV ad, and it's like you got it and you tried it, and you said, I got stains out of everything that I've ever had stains in before. And all you get on your line and you talk to all the other moms saying, hey, you gotta try this stuff. You're giving testimony. You ever found something that's like so, so amazing that you can't believe it's true? Like it's the restaurant that you've never, I mean, it's the greatest restaurant. You, t- you start telling people about it. Just giving testimony. What God has done in our life, we're supposed to tell people about it. That's the natural thing to do. Here's the deal. You're not going to overcome what you need to overcome if you're a secret agent Christian. You're a spiritual CIA. You're approaching your Christian life as some covert undercover operative. You see, here's the deal. You can't be undecided about Jesus or be embarrassed to be associated with him and still think that you're going to be an overcomer. You want to have your private little meeting with the saints here on Sunday morning, and, but, but you don't want to go out and, and let other people know that you're a follower of Jesus. You don't want to publicly identify with Christ. Guess what? That's that's what baptism is all about. And I don't think it's in your bulletin, but we have water baptism service two weeks from tonight. And if you haven't been baptized, you've accepted Jesus Christ and you followed him and you haven't been baptized, two weeks from tonight is a perfect time for you to be baptized. I encourage all of you to be here. It's a tremendous time as we see what God has done and doing in the lives of, of people, all ages. But this it's the point where we go public with our faith. And we're, we're proclaiming in a public way what Jesus Christ has done on the inside. The old person has is, is died and been buried, and we've been raised to new life in Christ. The old is gone, new has come. And we don't care who knows it. Actually, we want everybody to know it. So it becomes something public where we go public with our faith, and that's just it. We, 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 we can't have this private little meeting here and then walk out of here and, and like put our hat and glasses on. All of a sudden, now we're you know, we don't want people to see that, you know, we're associated with, we're one of those Jesus people. If it's good enough for here, it's good enough for there. You know, we ought to be telling people here more about what, what he's doing. Give testimony to someone sitting next to you, what God has done and is doing in your life. Tell, your, tell fellow believers what God's doing. That's encouraging. It's always encouraging for me to hear what God is doing and has done in somebody else's life. We ought to give more testimony to what God is doing. Anybody want to give a testimony? Murph. Got a testimony? God's done amazing things in your life. See Murph afterwards and he'll tell you the story. We're getting late here or else I'd have you come up here and I think you're going to take all my time if I don't. (laughs) Isaiah tells us that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed, bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we're healed. He did all this for us, and we're not going to be public in our identification with him. He did that for you. The least you can do is stand up for him. See, if you're a believer, you've been commissioned to be a witness. And a witness doesn't do anything more than tell what they know. You get called to be a witness on a, on a, in a court of law, and you're, you're, you're called to the witness stand. I can't tell somebody else's story. I can't tell what happened to somebody else. I'm called there to tell what I saw and what I experienced and what happened to me. That's it. I can't tell somebody else's story. I can only tell mine. And that's what being a witness is anyway. Just tell my story. 
We get so hung up on, I, I, gotta, I gotta be a theologian or some Bible teacher to, to give a witness, to, to tell a testimony. Just tell what God's done. Even if it's stuff where you're struggling at. Talk about the struggle. Here's where I'm struggling, but you know what? Here's what I know, because this is what I heard about what I am in Christ. I'm an overcomer, and he, through the blood of Jesus Christ, while I'm struggling, I know that I've overcome all of that because Jesus sees me as white. He looks through the red blood of Jesus and sees me as clean. What a testimony. They see you with all your stuff, and yet you give this testimony of who you are in Christ. Pastor Luke talked last week about being the light of the world. Jesus said, a city on a hill can't be hidden. He said, you don't light a lamp and put a basket over the top of it. You, you, you light a light you want people to see. It's meant to be seen. And he said to us, you're, you're lights in this world. You're meant to be seen. Go, go public. This isn't public. Remember Pastor Luke, last, for those that were here last week, he was shining this big bright light in the room where there's already light. It doesn't do much good. But out there where it's dark, it shines bright. So that others might see your good deeds. Not so that they can talk about you, but so they can talk about him. They overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And the third thing, it says that they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about great people of faith. Verse 13, it says, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners, nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed to go uh, for the country that they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That's why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Look, we have a future. We have a future. If you know Jesus Christ and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and he sees you as clean, look, you've got a future. This world isn't our home. We're temporary, we're temporary passers through here. This, this amount of time, whether you live 60, 70, 80, 90 years here on this earth, it's, you look at the big picture of things, it's a, it's, a, it's a blip on the map at best. Our investment of our time and our life here is for our future. God has great things for us to do here, but we don't live with just this world and this world only. We have hope of eternity that God has promised. Paul said it like this. He said, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He said, look, I can be here and keep doing what God wants me to do and, and, and being effective at, at, at lives being changed, but what would be even better for me is to go to heaven and be with God. Either way, he said, I, whether I'm here or I'm there, it's a win-win deal. I don't have to worry, I don't have to fear, I don't have to, I, I, I just, it's a win-win deal. Whether I'm here or there, it's all good. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three Hebrew children mentioned in Daniel chapter three. They, were, they, they wouldn't bow to the idol that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. 90 foot tall, 90 feet wide. They were supposed to bow to this thing and worship this idol. Being, being children of God, they said, no way, we can't do that. And we won't do that. Guess what? They got a meeting with the king. And he said, look. It's like he had the gun pointed at them. It was called a fiery furnace. He said, look, you will bow or I'm throwing you in the furnace. And when they said no, he said, look, you, it, it's like you will, I'm stoking this thing up seven times hotter than normal, you will bow or you're going in the furnace. And here's what they said, oh, oh Nebuchadnezzar, you know, we don't have to defend ourselves with you. We don't have to defend ourselves. The God that we serve is able to deliver us from that furnace. That takes a lot, a lot of faith. I, I can't believe that those guys knew that that was what was gonna happen although they believed that he could, because we know that God, with him, all things are possible, right? Okay, they knew, their faith said, God can deliver us, but their faith went even further to say, even if he doesn't, we're still not bowing. And you know, if you read the rest of the story, he threw them in the furnace, no hair on their head was singed, no, smoke of, no smell of smoke in their clothes. God was with them in the furnace, and they survived. So, I have this sense as the musicians are coming that um, 
we as, as Christians here, we, we're too tied to this world. We're invested here way, way too much. We love our lives here on this earth too much and we forget about what's, what's to come. We love our stuff. We're tied to this earth and what it, what it has to offer to, to the point that we're afraid to die. We should not be afraid to die. And I'm not saying, look, we gotta sign up to say, hey, who wants to die next? I'm not saying that. But we should not be afraid of death. Death, death is just a door to really living. That's the point when we really start living. This, this world right here, full of sin and trouble and sorrow and death and sickness and disease, we're promised no more sorrow, no more, no more dying, no more sickness, no more pain, no more tears, nothing in heaven. It's a perfect place. Why are we so afraid to go there? God has promised us that if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, this world is temporary. The Bible says that we're just like a vapor, here in a moment and then gone. See what, we're, we're tent dwellers here. And I think we've driven such long stakes so deep in the ground. We, we're too tied here. This world is not our home. God intervenes on behalf of those who do not love their lives so much that they're afraid to die. And even if he doesn't save us from death, he gives us new life, he gives us eternal life. And our fearlessness itself is the defeat of our enemy, of the enemy of our souls. Just being fearless. And he points that plastic little gun at me and I'm going, eh, I'll have to defend myself in front of you. You're the, you're the one, that, you're the loser, right? Remind him of his future when he tries to remind you of your past. Jesus said, whoever saves his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for Christ's sake will find it. See, here's, here's the thought that I wanna leave you with. God places victory in your reach. We've overcome by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony. God places that victory in our reach. He doesn't put it in our hand. He places victory in our reach. He doesn't put it in our hand because he wants us to reach out in faith to take hold of it. It's by grace that you're saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Everyone born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. It's by faith. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? There's a few things that I wanna just reach out to you this morning. And the first one is this, to those who are coming to faith in Jesus for the first time, accepting his free gift of salvation. It's, it's a free gift and I encourage you this morning to take it with every head bowed and every eyes closed. I wanna ask this morning for those that are coming to faith in Jesus. This morning you come to a place where you said, I need Jesus and I don't wanna leave this room today without opening my life and saying, Jesus, come in, forgive my sin, take all my guilt, take all my stain, forgive me, set me free and give me this hope of eternal life. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor Jeff, pray with me, pray for me. I'm coming to faith in Jesus today for the very first time. Anybody? I'll give you a moment to respond. All right, I want every head up and every eye open. And here's my second, here's my second uh, group that I'm aiming to. There's some of you this morning that you've been living in the shadows. You've been doing this undercover, covert operation. You come to church and you might do your thing here, but when you leave, when you go to your place of employment and you're in a home, wherever you go, you're in this undercover mode. And this morning, you know, and you're making a commitment today, the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart that it's time to come out of the shadow and it's time to go public. No more hiding. You're gonna go vocal. You're, you're, you're gonna be willing to speak a word of testimony. You're gonna give, you're gonna give voice to the fact that your faith is in Jesus Christ and you're not, a, you're, you don't care who knows. If that's you this morning with every eye open and everybody looking around, it's time to go public. This is kind of a private place, but if we can't go public here, it's gonna be hard to go public out there. So if that's you today and you're saying, I'm making a new commitment today, that I'm gonna go public with my faith. If that's you, just stand. Don't just, don't just stand because other people are standing. Come on, don't do that. I'm not talking you into sitting down, but some of you are already doing this and you would say, you know what, I'm standing with these people and uh, I'm already doing this and I'm gonna commit to continue to be a person uh, who is a light 
uh, that is going to shine for Jesus. And there, there's no putting a basket over it. You're just going to live out there. You're going to live a light. You are a light, and you're going to continue to do that wherever you go. If that's you, and you're just going to make a commitment today to say, that's, what, that's what, who I am, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. It's getting brighter. Some of you might be saying this morning, I'm too tied to this world. I want to be a light, but I'm tied here, and I, I want to be free. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be fearful of death. I don't want to be too tied to my stuff and my things that I can't do what God is calling me and asking me to do. Make that commitment in your heart. As we pray this morning, and we're going to sing this song as a song of commitment, maybe some of you, as Pastor Weaver mentioned earlier in the service, you're, you're needing victory. You're needing victory over some situation or circumstance in your life. Maybe it's something you, you stood for here, or maybe it's a situation, a relationship, a need, a physical thing, whatever it is. And you would just come this morning as an act of faith and stand here saying, I need God's victory in my life over whatever it might be. And by faith, just step forward today and believe that God's going to meet you here and we're going to ask him to meet those needs. Would you make this song a commitment this morning as we pray? Father, we thank you this morning, God, that you have created us and designed us. You have a plan. You have a purpose. Lord, you want us to walk in the victory that comes through Jesus Christ. It's not of ourselves. It's all about you. And so today, God, I pray that we wouldn't just be overcomers in position, but that we'd be overcomers in, in the way we live our life, in practice that we wouldn't just use that umbrella as a, as a walking cane, but we would use it for what it was created for, to help us to be an overcomer. It's your blood. It's the word of our testimony that has made us an overcomer. It's, it's the fact that we don't love our life so much that, that we're afraid of, of death and the future. We just want to live fully how you've created us and designed us to live. Help us, God, to, to live an overcoming life to stand in that position and, and, and be overcoming in every circumstance and situation. Meet us here in this place, I pray in Jesus' name.